We are going to uh, we're going to transition now into chapter eight, uh, just to kind of give everybody an idea of where we're heading. Today is January the fourth, or I'm sorry, January the fifth. Pardon, January the fifth. February, March, April, May. Exactly four months from today. And I checked that. Exactly four months from today, Tuesday, May the fourth. Your AP Human Geography exam takes place from 1 o'clock in the afternoon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay? It's two hours. So, actually, it goes probably till about 3.15. Um, so, we have four months. In that four months, we are going to finish the book. We're going to cover Chapter 8, which is Political Geography. We're going to touch on Chapter 9, which is Development talking about economics around the world. Chapter 10 is on agriculture and food. It's always a favorite of students. Chapter 11 is on um, industry and manufacturing. Uh, chapter 12 is on settlements and services. And chapter 13 is on urban cities. So that's kind of the content. That's the direction where we're headed. My goal is that by the middle of April, we are done. So the last two weeks of April and the first few days of May will be all review. Now, I want you to understand something. Just because this class technically is done because you take the AP exam on Tuesday afternoon, May the 4th, does not mean that this class is over. Okay, yes, you will take the AP exam on Tuesday, May the 4th, but you are still getting grades for the next couple weeks leading up to your second semester exams. We are going to have math quizzes again, and those math quizzes will happen once the AP exam is over, okay? Plus, we probably will have some cumulative year presentations where, if I'm allowed to at the time, I may invite an elementary class in, and each of you will do short lessonettes, is what I call them. And by lessonette, I mean you will be talking no more than three or four minutes. Because if you have elementary kids, you want to keep their attention that long. Okay? So you got to be short. Um, so there are some things that I'm already in the planning stages of putting forward. So I want you to know a lot of kids think, oh, well, the AP exam's over. I can just check out of AP whatever class I'm in. That's not the case. I'm still going to be teaching right up until, um, you know, before exams. Um, so that, I just want to put that out there. But we're full speed ahead. Um, we're going to be talking about Chapters 8, Issue uh, 1 and 2 today, tomorrow, and we may have to finish it on Thursday. We will be going over our vocabulary um, this week as well. And then next week we will cover key issues three and four. And then, of course, I think it's Monday the 18th, we have off. It's a national holiday, Martin Luther King Day, Jr. Um, and then that Tuesday and Wednesday, the 19th and 20th, 20th of January, we're already having our Chapter 8 FRT review. So same thing as we had in the first semester, the pacing is very quick. I don't believe report cards have been mailed out yet, but um, you should be getting those soon enough. Notice up on the board, I have not erased that. Those are all due dates for today. So one of the nice things uh, for you is by doing the work that you did over Christmas break, your homework this week is going to be very light. Okay, so that may help you kind of ease into uh, AP a little bit. Um, and help you with some of your other classes. This week, in terms of homework, it'll be very light. It'll pick up a little bit more next week, but that's at least good news for you this week. Yes, Rachel? So wait, the AP exam is like not at the same time we take all the other exams? No, the, a the AP exam is set by College Board, and there's like 22 AP exams that College Board does. And so each AP class, um, has a set date and time that it's administered. Oh, are so, we going to be like taking something? I know you said like math quizzes and stuff. Are we going to be taking something around the time we're doing the exam? No, I won't give you your math 
prison until after we're done with these things. So I, I won't even worry about them because I want you to focus the back half of April and those first few days in May, believe me, you all are going to be focused on preparing for that exam. You have a lot of material that you're going to be going through. And I'm going to talk about probably on Friday a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about strategies that you can implement now to start studying for the exam. Because now that we're in January, now you're going to hear me focus a lot more on what are you going to do to prepare yourself for the AP exam. Because the goal should be to score a 3, 4, or 5. So if you score a 3, 4, or 5, you pass and you can earn college credits. If you get a 1 or 2, you can't earn college credits. So your goal at this point is what can I do now in January so I'm not stressing in April when the exam is two weeks away, what can I do? Kendra? Isn't like our final exam, like before our other final exams, do we just not have a history final exam like during that, that exam week? Yeah, so that exam week, that's kind of a benefit for you. I don't know when your exam is gonna be at the end of the year, mm -hmm. um, but let's say your exam is first thing in the morning bring a parent note, um, but you don't have to come in for your history exam because you've already taken it. It's the AP exam. So you will have no exam uh, in May for the second semester in your normal exam schedule. If your exam is the second exam, then as long as you have a parent note, you can sign out early and leave that day. So I think if your exam is second, you could probably sign out around 1030 in the morning. Um, if your social studies exam is first thing in the morning, you probably wouldn't have to come in until like 10, 15 in the morning. Again, you just have to have a parent note stating the reason why you're coming in late or leaving early. But a lot of kids in past years, some kids have got together, um, got like an early breakfast together, you know, during the social studies exam, just to kind of talk and vent about aping and geography. Um, Several kids in the class have gotten together for like a breakfast or first watch or you know something like that, or even just sleep in. Any other questions, Jim? How many questions are there on the final AP exam? Um, that's a really good question, and I'm going to be getting into that closer we get to um, the AP. But so uh, we'll just say this, and then we got to get into our lesson. Sixty multiple choice questions, all standardized questions. All 60 questions are standardized. So, and they're grouped. So you'll have a picture of China, and then you'll have two or three questions that are posed about that same one. So you'll move to question four and five, and there'll be a new picture or a new map, and those two questions will be on there. So that's the all that's all 60 questions. They're grouped and they're all based on stem line. That's the first part of the test, 60 minutes. Second part of the test is three different FRQs, 25 minutes apiece, and you have a total of 75 minutes. So the total time of testing is two hours and 15 minutes, with a 10 minute break in between part one and part two. So total time testing, including the break, is about two hours and 25 minutes. Yeah? Um, are the FRQs gonna be like, Kind of like the ones we did last year. Are we going to know what they are beforehand? Or is there going to be like a list of ones that it could be? Or are we just going to go in with no idea? And just pull them you will have absolutely no idea. But I can tell you that this is why we have been doing the AP classroom. Um, the FRQs that you're going to have on the final exam are going to be very similar to the type of FRQs you answered in AP classroom. So that's why we're going to continue doing AP classroom. Those are the type of questions you're going to see. So that's why you need as much practice as possible. Yeah? How is it graded? Are they like graded separately? Like the FRQs and the... So usually, usually what happens is they meet the first week of June um, in the AP, the AP doing geography meets in Cincinnati, Ohio. There's thousands of graders in one room, they have the um, they have the multiple choice, the normal multiple choice graders. When they're done with that section, they take 
they pass to a separate room where they have a panel of three, and those three read with three FRQs to each grade them, and I believe they take a, a, an average of those three. And then at that point, the films determine what your score is. So there's, there's multiple rooms, but your AP test will not be graded entirely by one person. There's multiple people looking at it. That's why we have thousands and thousands of appreciation graders. All right, any other questions? These are, these are great questions. It, it's probably a good idea to talk about this. I know we've cut into our class time a little bit today, but part of the deal we can finish this on Thursday. If you have your key issues packet, would you take that out for me? Um, and take out a, a highlighter or a pen. And also, if you would turn to page 261. Page 261, um, chapter 8 is all about political geography. So all about political geography. Um, are you with us? Um, I want you to go ahead and highlight this question here up at the top. Um, where are states distributed? This is the question that we're going to be looking at in issue one. Let me ask you this. When you think of political geography, take those two words, political and geography. What is the first thing that comes to your mind? Political and geography, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Ginger? Politics. Politics, okay. Territories. Territories, good, that's a good word. Countries. Countries, okay. Countries and territories are a little different. We'll get into that a little bit. Rachel? Borders. Borders, that's key, that's a great term. What else, Peyton? Uh, state borders. Okay, borders. What else? something that I think about, conflict, right, conflict. Um, when you talk about political geography, we're going to see there is some conflict in the world. So let's kind of break down the first three questions here to kind of ease us into uh, some of our discussion. Go ahead and highlight the one and two because these are definitions. Um, we want to make sure that we're understanding what a state is. Now, um, there are, there are two types of states. Okay, there are, there are two types that you're gonna see. And for the purpose of this lesson, um, I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. So if you have a capital S, I'm going to underline it for the capital. If you have a capital S and you see it a state, that typically is referring to a country. So if I were to say, Stephanie, identify one state, capital S, in the continent of South America. You would think about, okay, what are some countries, what are some states, capital S, in South America, and you may say Brazil, okay? So a state, capital S, is the same as a country, all right? Now, if you see state, small s, okay, if you see a state, with a small s, and I'll put a little box around it, all right, that is going to be a state or territory. So if I said identify a state, lowercase s, in the United States of America, someone in here could say Florida, okay? State capital S carries more weight than state lowercase s. Does that make sense? 
That's really important. So what is a state? Here we go. An area organized into a political unit. And you want to highlight this. This is, this is very important. This is a key part of this entire chapter. And it's ruled by an established government. Put a little box around that. Established government. Okay, a state has government that has control over its internal and foreign affairs. A little box around internal and foreign affairs. What would be an example of an internal affair? That we, that we have here in the United States, what would be an internal affair? Election. The election, yep. Another example would be the Antifa riots. Okay, calming the riots going on. Another would be taxes. Do your parents pay federal taxes? Yeah, I pay federal taxes. You have to, everybody does, if you're working. All right, so that's an example of an internal affair. Foreign affair, what would be an example of a foreign affair? Just so we have some understanding with key words in this definition, Peyton? War. War, if we went to war with China. Okay, that would be a foreign affair. Yikes, right? Trading. Trading, yeah. For example, if we're trading oil with Saudi Arabia, or we're trading um, oranges and apples with Bolivia. Okay, that is a foreign affair. You know what else is a foreign affair? Immigration. All right, we talked about immigration in Chapter 3. Immigration would be a foreign affair. A state occupies a defined territory. What does that mean? Occupies a defined territory. You want to put this in parentheses. It has borders. Okay? A state has borders. Does the United States have borders? What's, what country is to the north of us? Canada. Canada. Country to the south is? Mexico. Mexico. We have borders with those two countries. So we have a defined territory that is ours. All states, capital S, have that. And has a permanent population. Do we have a permanent population in this country? I would say yes. Does our population change? Yes. Okay, and you understand why it does, right? Because we talked about the DTM, the demographic transition model. People die, people are born. So. Yes, we have a permanent population because people are living here. We're not going to other countries. We live here. But we also have a changing population. Kind of does like this. Have you ever been on a roller coaster? Okay, you have your ups and your downs. Population changes like that because people die, people are born. All right, sovereignty. This is another one. You want to highlight this. Sovereignty is the ability of a state to govern its territory without intervention from other states. I want you to highlight this idea here, without intervention from other states. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? Without intervention from other states. What does that mean to you, Ginger? Like it's independent. Yeah. It's not like a colony that like depends on its own country. Maybe you put in parentheses by that the word independent, okay? A sovereign state is independent. There's nobody telling it what to do. Okay, is there anyone telling the United States how to govern itself? If some state, capital S, tried to do that, that's an act of war. And that could escalate very, very quickly. So sovereignty is very important, class. Sovereignty is very important to political geography. All right, number three. Um, Logan, help us out with this. You want to highlight this. Six largest states in order. Uh, the six largest states in order are Russia, Canada, United States, China, Brazil, and Australia. Okay, now, I, I want you to put kind of in parentheses off to the side. This is land size, right? This wouldn't be population. This is in land size. So the six largest states in land size would be Russia, Canada, United States, China, Brazil, and Australia. 
Now, before I go any farther, in your book, I want you just to look down in your book, page 261. Um, I want you to highlight the word microstate and then highlight the definition right after it. States with very small land areas. And then down below in figure 8-2, you see where it says Monaco is a microstate, the smallest microstate in the United Nations. Monaco is a principality ruled by a prince. A microstate is a fancy word for smallest countries in the world. If you were to Google the 10 smallest countries in the world, you probably would see another name for that come up as microstates. Those are microstates. The smallest countries in the world, whatever those are, wherever those are, those are called microstates. Monaco, I pretty much promise, is going to be in that top 10. I don't know where it is, but it, it, it will be in that top 10. All right, go ahead and flip over to page 262, 263, and let's keep watching this here. All right, let's look at question uh, four, five, and six. Um, how many microstates are recognized? What do many have in common? We kind of already talked about this. List any six that you can find on a map and state where they're at. If you can only come up with three on your own, you'll have to look up three more. You can always look at world maps. Um, some of the ones that I, how many of you said 24 microstates? Do you have that, 24 microstates? That's good. Um, how many of you, many of the islands in the Caribbean Sea, the Pacific Ocean, and the Indian Ocean? How many of you identified those? There are some microstates that are actually on land, but many of the microstates in the world are islands in the middle of nowhere. Um, some of the ones that I listed, and again, I want to hear from some of you some of the other examples, but the examples that I pulled, six microstates, include Micronesia, that's in the Pacific Ocean, that's what's called the South Pacific, Seychelles, okay, that's off the coast of Africa, that's a very tiny island state country in the Indian Ocean, Malta, okay, Malta is off of Italy uh, in the Mediterranean Sea, St. Kitts and Nevis, those are island states, countries in the Caribbean Sea, Bahrain, very tiny country in the Persian Gulf, and of course, one of the most famous microstates, Andorra, which is completely in the Pyrenees Mountains between France and Spain. What are some other examples that you have? Okay, Peyton? Guam. Guam. In the Atlantic Ocean. Okay. Or the South Pacific. Yes, South Pacific. What else? What else did you have? Other examples that you have. There's so many. I put Singapore and Indonesia. You said Singapore? Yeah. Okay. All right. How about, yeah? Would Luxembourg be one? It could be. I guess you could say that. I was thinking, yeah. Well, first you said we started with the Marshall Islands. Yep. Marshall Islands would be one in the Pacific. How? And Asia. Yeah. Yeah, in the South, in the South Pacific. Um, two that I was thinking off the top of my head, these are both in Italy. How about San Marino? And how about Vatican City? Those would both be microstates, right? So there's some other examples that you could, you could write down. All right, uh, Steph, what'd you have for number five? When was the United Nations established and by whom? Very good. Um, go ahead and underline established in 1945. And who was it? Circle the Allied Powers. How many of you are familiar with World War II? Okay. When did World War II end? And the day was on board. Yeah, 1945, exactly. So the very first thing 
that the Allied powers, remember World War II, um, the US and the Allied powers were fighting three Axis powers, right? The Axis powers and the Allied powers, quick history lesson here. You have the Japanese, you have the Germans, and you have the Italians, right? The Allies defeated the, um, the Italians and the Germans first. The Japanese were a little stubborn, but once the atomic bombs were dropped, uh, the Japanese quickly surrendered, right? So once those three were defeated, one of the very first things that came on the scene was the United Nations. And it was a peacekeeping, a global peacekeeping organization, a place where all states could go to air their grievances against some other nation, other country, so that another world war would all right, so number six, the reason for which membership in the UN grew significantly, you need to highlight these dates, okay? This is very important. The United Nations, when it started out, maybe had a dozen or two members. Today, the United Nations has over 150 countries in it. That's a lot of growth, isn't it? Why is that? 1955? 16 countries had been liberated from Nazi Germany. So remember, Adolf Hitler kills himself in the bunker, okay? It took a while for all the Nazis to be tried in the Nuremberg trials to get Nazi and fascism out of Europe. Slowly but surely, the 10 years after World War II, liberation comes to many of these countries. What's one of the first things these countries do when they have their independence? They join the United Nations because it gives them that security blanket. It gives them a voice. 1960, 17 countries except Ethiopia had been former colonies of Great Britain and France. They were added. So just between 1955 and 1960, how many countries are added just in five years? Do some quick math there. What is that? 16 plus 17. Perfect, thank you, Jackie. 33, right? 33 countries right there were added. Then, let's look here, 1990s, um, 26 countries that uh, resulted from the breakup of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia at the time of the Cold War. So remember, when did communism fall across Europe? 1990. So in the early 1990s, as communism falls, dozens of countries gain independence, and what do they do? They join the United Nations. What your book doesn't tell you from the 1990s up to 2021, there have been probably over two, two to three dozen more countries that have come on board and joined the United Nations. And that's why today there are a cl close to 150, if not 150 countries that are in the United Nations. So pretty significant when you're talking about this organization. All right, last two on the first page here. Um, Kat, what do you say for number seven? Who are the five permanent members of the Security Council? The five permanent members of the Security Council are China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Okay, I want you to highlight those five. That means these countries will always be in the United Nations. Okay, the Security Council makes final decisions. In your family, let me put it to you this way. In your family, who makes the final decisions on, I don't know, whatever it could be, okay? Who, who usually makes the final decisions in your family? Your dad, your mom? Is it a whole family decision? Give me some feedback. Your mom, okay? Who makes the final decisions on things? From very little or very big, where you're going to eat tonight? Or what, you're, what are you going to do for vacation this summer? Is it a family decision, a group decision? Is it a mom decision? Is it a dad decision? Or is it a mom and dad decision? You don't have to answer. Think about that. Okay. Within the United Nations, you have all of these countries. The question you should ask yourself is, well, who makes the final decision within the United Nations? What is the leadership of the United Nations? The leadership is the Security Council. 
these five countries make the final decisions. Everyone else has a voice and can share their opinion, but these five countries have the ultimate vote. Okay, so they're very powerful, very powerful. All right, number eight, go ahead and highlight this. Uh, there are two very clear problems. You wanna circle that word problem. Identify some problems the UN faces as it attempts to, attempts to operate and influence the world. Okay, these are real problems. Number one, the UN relies on individual countries to supply troops. Because of this, the UN often lacks enough troops to keep peace effectively. Did you know that about the UN? The UN actually has no army. The UN has no air force. The UN has no navy. They have no marines. They have no coast guard. They have zero military. So if there is a conflict in Africa, or there's a conflict in South America, or there's a conflict in, let's say, some part of Asia, who are they going to call? No, they don't call the Ghostbusters. They call different countries within the United Nations and say, hey, would you be willing to send 10,000 of your troops? Would you be willing to send 50,000 of your troops? We need your troops to come in and calm this situation. And if a country says, nope, not going to send it, then what does the UN have to do? They have to go and ask the next country. So some people view the United Nations as ineffective because they don't have their own military or their own troops. Number two, the UN must maintain strict neutrality in separating warring factions, which is difficult to do. So for example, if you're the UN and you go into Sudan and you clearly see that the Muslims are mercilessly and callously killing Christians, stringing them up, doing terrible, terrible things to them, and human emotion is like, I want to I get those Muslims. They can't do that to those Christians. But the UN has to be what's called non-bias. How many of you know what that, have you heard, heard that term, non-bias? If you're non-bias, that means you don't have an opinion. You're willing to listen to both sides. And a lot of people say, UN, you need to act. A lot of times the UN doesn't act because it doesn't want to get into situations like that, even though there's genocide or ethnic cleansing going on. All right, quickly, um, I want you to highlight in your book uh, on page 262, I want you to highlight figure 8-3, UN members. Okay, there's a map on page 262. And it says UN members, nearly the entire land area of the world, part of the UN. Okay? And you see there's 193 members and then there's different colors. Please look over this map. You need to know when some of these countries joined in what decade. So some were added in the 1940s and it goes all the way up to the 2010s. And believe it or not, the gray at the very bottom of the little key, there are some non-members. Okay, there are some non-members. So this is a map that's very, very important very early on in this chapter. Maybe make yourself a little note on page 162, 163. Review this for the AP exam. Okay, something very, very important, the makeup of the United Nations. Pretty significant. All right. Let's get through to issue one. How about that? All right. Number nine, there is some disagreement about how many states there actually are in the world 
because the regions which may or may not actually be states. So different places in the world, um, borders are disputed. Okay? Just like we talked about with ethnicities, remember we talked about India and Pakistan and how Jammu and Kashmir, that region separating those two countries, that border is disputed. We talked about that with ethnicities in chapter seven. Some places around the world, borders are disputed. Okay, they're not as clear as America and Canada or America and Mexico. Okay, people disagree. These are three examples. So I want you just maybe put on the side three examples. All right, these are three examples of where borders are disputed in the world today. All right, number one, we have Korea, North and South Korea. How many of you know that South Korea is a free democratic society? How many of you know that? How many of you know that North Korea is a closed communist society? So you know both of those facts? We're on the same page. One state, so if you believe that Korea is one state this is what you're saying. The Korean governments should unify North Korea and South Korea into one sovereign state. Take one guess if they ever did unify, which I don't think they will, not in my lifetime at least. If they did unify, what type of government do you think they would have? Do you think they would have democratic? No. What would they have? Communist. And that's why probably very small likelihood that would happen. Unless you had the Korean War too, right? Two states, if according to the United Nations, North Korea and South Korea are two separate states, and that should be a capital S, I apologize. And that's what we have today. North Korea and South Korea are separate countries, separate states, capital S. All right, next one. People's Democratic Republic of China and the Republic of China or Taiwan. How many of you know that Taiwan today is a free, even though it's a tiny island, how many of you knew that Taiwan is a free democratic country today? Raise your hand, be honest. If you knew that Taiwan is a free democratic country today. Okay, a couple of them. Taiwan's very, very tiny. China wants Taiwan badly, okay? Back in the 1940s, um, there was a Chinese Civil War and all of the freedom fighters fled to Taiwan. They got out of China before the communists took over. They fled to Taiwan and they set up a democratic country. Today, guess who one of the major countries in the world that is an ally of Taiwan and gives military support to Taiwan? That would be us, the United States of America. So China doesn't want to pick a fight with Taiwan because they know who's standing behind them. One state, so if China says, well, Taiwan is ours, this is what you gotta say. China has control of Taiwan, uh, not the case at this time in history. Two states, nationalists control Taiwan and communists control China. And that's how it is today. It is a two state, but there are some people that argue for the one state. And then finally, you have Western Sahara um, or the Swahari Republic. Um, and what's the country that claims control of Western Sahara today? It's a, a major North African country. Morocco. Morocco. How many of you know where Morocco is in Africa? Okay, it's on the Atlantic coast, the north uh, west coast of, of Africa. So one state, the Polisero Front, this is a government in Western Sahara, um, has rightful control of the territory. Um, no state, if you agree, that Morocco has controlled the territory. This is a battle that has gone back and forth for dozens, if not centuries. And honestly, in doing some research over the break, um, even at the beginning of 2021, this debate Western Sahara as a country or Western Sahara as a territory of Morocco still rages on today. There has been no clear-cut answer as to what's going on there. So we, we still have the same, same issue. All right, last three for today. 
Um, this is kind of a little graphic organizer talking about ancient states versus medieval states, and then we have a definition to kind of close us out here. Um, ancient states, talking about this in, in key issue one, um, they were called city-states. They were independent. They fought against each other. How many of you remember talking about Greece or the uh, Samaria in world history? Remember talking about that a couple years ago in seventh grade, about the, the Greeks, ancient Greece, and the city-states of Athens and Sparta? Some of you remember that? Okay. Many of the ancient cities were what's called city-states. Walls created boundaries around the cities. Um, the city controlled agricultural land surrounding the individual city-states. And then the countryside provided the city with defense uh, from other city-states. Mesopotamia, which was an ancient Sumer, uh, was a region that saw city-states. Ancient Greece also saw city-states. The two most powerful being Athens and Sparta. Okay. There was no unity in the ancient states. The city-states oftentimes fought each other over resources and land. Now, when we move to the medieval, how many of you remember the medieval times? Remember talking about castles and kings and the feudal system? Do you remember the feudal system? Vaguely, maybe. Um, the medieval times, there were large numbers of estates. Does anybody remember what the states were Estates were called with the land start with an M. Manor. Manor. Good, Kat. They were called manors, right? That included included the lord or noble's estate and the land that the people worked on. Uh, and that whole idea was called feudalism. Um, there were kings um, that had very large estates, and then they would break up the land to the lesser uh, rulers. Consolidation of estates under kings created uh, the basis for future states. How many of you have this information on 10 and 11? Right? If you don't have that filled in, make sure you, you add on to that. That's very important. A key part there at the end of key issue one. All right, the last thing, uh, we'll go to um, Jackson. What do you have for self-determination? The idea that ethnicities have the right to govern themselves. Okay, good. We'll, we'll kind of park here. I want you to highlight this. Um, I want you to highlight this concept. I want to talk about this for a minute. Self-determination, we don't really deal with this as much in the United States of America um, because we have a sovereign government, but in many places around the world, you have many ethnicities living within one state, capital S. And they all say, I have the right to govern myself. Um, oftentimes that gets them into conflict with the ruling government because they don't want to listen to the ruling government. They want to have their own government. But they can't do that because they're not in power. Do you see where the conflict comes in? Um, and so we see this in places of the world. But this concept, self-determination, simply is the idea that ethnicities have the right to govern themselves. Self-determination is very similar to the idea of sovereignty that we talked about a little bit earlier in issue one. Tomorrow and Thursday, we will finish the issue two, okay? Um, and then we will go over our vocabulary this week, um, and I will talk to you a little bit more just leave your key issues packet on your desk. All you have to do is just leave it on your desk. Make sure your name is on it, please. Please, please, please make sure your name is on it. We'll come around after you've left and collect it. Thank you. Have a good lunch.